Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Face in My Fear of Action presentation, Jesus discusses how we create fears in order to avoid action, the importance of learning to act even though we are afraid never using our fear as an excuse to become unloving and refusing to revert to inactivity on the issue of learning and growing in love. Recorded on the 8th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Last session of the day. Hurrah! Hurrah! <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, <clears throat> And at the end of the day, we'll be halfway through. Yes. There you go. Third day. Okay. So the topic of this discussion with you is facing my fear of action. And I'd like to firstly focus you on two parts to this particular discussion. The first part is fear itself. What I see the majority of people doing is seeing fear as if it's real, as if it actually is worth something. And in fact, many of you are using it as your God. It is, it is the only thing that you determine your life by. And, and this is a very, very damaging thing to do. The thing is you must understand about fear is that, firstly, fear is a human creation. God didn't create it. <clears throat> we did. Now, the interesting thing about... Oh, I'm going to have another cough. Sorry about that. Interesting thing about um, human creations is, from God's perspective, they all must be destroyed in the long run. So, so, and, and it's also up to the people who do, created them to destroy them. Isn't that interesting? Because that means that it's up to us to destroy our fears. No one's going to do it for us. What I see most of us doing is that we project on the world around us that the world around us must uh, deal with our fear for us. And in fact, we have such a strong projection at the world around us that we get very, very angry when the world around us doesn't destroy our fear, you know, deal with our fear for us. We go to war for our fear. All of the war on the planet is caused by fear. So you know how many of you ladies sort of have this viewpoint that if you were in power, there'd be no war? Well, I actually feel if you were in power, there'd be more war. Because more, you have more fear than many men do. Right? So the reality is a lot of the war that goes on on the planet is because of your fear. Men are trying to save you from it. Right? So this is an indication that we need to address this particular emotion. Fear is a human creation and all of its subsequent results, which include war, are all the subsequent result of us living in it rather than actually addressing it. So, so the very first thing we need to see is that since fear is a human creation, fear has to be destroyed by humans. It can't be destroyed by God. It's a human creation. It's an exercise of our will to remain in fear. This is one thing that I feel that many of you are still not grasping. It's an exercise of your will to remain in fear. You are choosing to remain in it. It's an exercise of your will. It's a creation of your will. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of your fears were created by you, because they weren't. They were created by all sorts of events in your past, and, and whether that be in your childhood or whether it be from your own personal choices and decisions, which created more events that you became afraid of. 
But I am suggesting that if fear is going to be removed from you, you have to do it. Mm. I think many of you have been expecting God to do it for you. And then when God doesn't do it for you, you just get angry with him. <laughs> right? But he's not going to do it for you because it's not his creation. It's our creation. We have to get rid of it if we're going to progress. So that's, that's an important fact, isn't it? That we need to come to terms with emotionally. That, that actually the fear that exists within us has to be, that we have to choose to address it. It's not something that somebody else is going to address for us. Paul, you'd like to ask? Um, you know, with um, um, causal emotions and sadness, that if we feel it to the depth, God can remove mm -hmm. some of our emotions. Is that similar in fear if we have the willingness? No. No. Mm. So it's like all the fears which have accumulated in my life, Mm -hmm. through school and home and all that sort of stuff, I need to feel those out of myself <laughs> one at a time, in a sense, or, or, or together, but that extent of... Well, the problem is a lot of our fears are not even real. They're not even emotions that you have. <laughs> That's the interesting thing too, huh? They, they, many of your fears you manufacture so that you can stop feeling the real emotion. Do you get that? So many of your fears are manufactured. Many, uh, many are manufactured. In other words, you manufacture a fear that has nothing to do with the... Uh, many are manufactured, I don't think so. Manufact manufact manufactured, I don't think so. <laughs> manufactured. <laughs> right. um, maybe it's best to give you a few examples of a manufactured fear, shall we? Okay. Well, how many of you are afraid of snakes? Look your hand. Yeah, that's a manufactured fear. So you're not going to have to feel your fear of snakes. Because it's a manufactured fear, it's something that's not real. You know what happened, why you have your fear of snakes? I've talked to you about this before. Because your mother's or father's love was removed when a snake was present. So your real fear is about having love removed when snakes are around. That's your real fear. And the fear of snakes themselves is just a manufactured fear. A fear that you prefer to feel and then avoid. And it helps you avoid the actual fear, which is that mum or dad won't love you when snakes are around. Do you see? Like, so one's a manufactured fear and the other is a real fear. So many of our fears that we think we're going to have to experience, we don't actually have to experience because they are manufactured by us in order to avoid another one, the real one, the real feeling that we're trying to prevent. Right. Now, when I realised that, gee, it made a lot of <laughs> change to my life, right? You know, I've talked to you before about just some of the physical ailments that I got rid of just by realizing actually that the reason why they existed was because of something that occurred with my father or mother in the event rather than something that occurred with that particular thing so like i i i used to have terrible responses with hay fever with with cats for example once i realized what the true cause of that was it had nothing to do with cats well it had something to do with cats and my father's violence towards them <laughs> And my, when my father got violent towards them, there, there was a removal of love and, and also a threat of violence. So, of course, you get worried about those particular things as a child and then you, you associate the cat with the threat rather than the family member <laughs> who's the threat. You follow? And that's what we do. So we've got to understand that many of our fears are actually manufactured on purpose. 
either in our childhood or in our adult life in order to avoid other fears, in order to avoid other emotions. Many of you are doing this. Many of you are doing this. And then what we have a tendency to do after we manufacture them, of course, is we decide to justify them, don't we? So we justify them to ourselves. Yes, I am afraid of snakes. You know, we justify them. So, so now we're saying, okay, I am afraid of snakes. And I'm going, well, why are you afraid of snakes? Has one ever bitten you? No. Have you ever been harmed by one? Probably not. You know, how many of you have ever been bitten by a snake, actually? One. No one. You haven't either. So none. So how many of you are afraid of snakes again? Right, more than half the audience. Yeah, more than half the audience. I mean, if one's right on your feet or something, who would be afraid of that? Right, more than three quarters of the audience. And none of you have been bitten by one. Yeah. <laughs> so inter isn't that interesting? Do, has anyone you know been bitten by one, like in your family? Put up your hand if someone in your family has been bitten by one. Y yeah, Peter, right? And because he handles them. <laughs> so I think we should put that hand down. <laughs> you with him, of course. Huh? <laughs> but he, he, works at, he loves them and he handles them all the time. And he's not afraid of getting bitten by them, ironically. <laughs> so there's only a couple that, who we even know that have been bitten by snakes. Well, how about that? And yet the fear exists. The fear exists because we've manufactured the fear in order to avoid a deeper fear. The deeper fear is the fear of love being removed when that, and vi potential violence when the snake is around. That's what we've done. Right. So once we disconnect our, ourselves from the actual fear, the, all of the imagined ones also don't need to exist anymore, do they? Yeah. Claudia? Most of you are a bit challenged by this, right? Well, why is that? I don't, it's logical, isn't it? Hmm? Far away. Oh, I'm just missing a link. I don't understand why love is removed when a snake is present. Because the mum or father has a fear of snakes. They've done the same thing. They, they, they have associated their fear with snakes and now they've got a lot of rage and anger towards a snake. Whenever a person's in rage or anger and, and terror, they can't love you and they won't. And so love is removed in that moment. There's no love. So the child goes from feeling some love from its parents to feeling when the snake comes, no love. So there's, so there's an association in the child between the lack of love and the actual object that the parents have removed the love because of. Does that make sense? And of course those parents have done the same with those parents and so forth and so forth. Right? They've done it. It's a systematic process that we've done. Yep, so there is direct association. I don't want to get stuck on this, guys, but maybe if I ask Igor. <coughs> uh, wh what about, like, with the snake uh, example? Uh, I don't think I've ever been... Uh, I've grown up in a concrete jungle, so could my mother's fear just been passed on directly to me without interacting with the snake? Yeah, and every time she sees one on a telly or every time she, her love's removed, every time. So, of course, we're going to have some... Yeah. Anyway, let's not get too bogged down with that because that I'm, I'm just saying that's an evidence of none of you, none of you have actually personally been bitten by one, and yet you're afraid of being bitten by one. So that tells me your fear is not actually real. It's it's like like something else created it, right? It has to be something else. And what I'm saying is that most of our fears are manufactured by other events that we don't want to feel. And this is where we've got to get really honest with ourselves. So that's the first thing. We need to see that fear is, what is it again? You know, false expectations appearing real, which is really saying it's false belief, isn't it? Right? So fear is a false belief. So can you see, if I have a fear of action, I have false beliefs about actions. That's really what I've got. False beliefs about taking action. Right. And we've got a mountain of those, haven't we? Like, you know, we talked about change on, on the first day. 
And yeah, we've got a whole list of things that we don't want, to, we think we're going to happen if we change or whatever. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we have a whole heap of false beliefs about action. Now, what destroys false beliefs again? Truth. Truth, okay. So, so false beliefs only destroyed by truth. So you can see that now we're starting to see the relationship. We've got a relationship between faith and truth because without faith it's highly unlikely we'll believe that truth is worth it right and then now we've got a relationship between truth and fear truth is the antidote to fear so we need to accept truth if we're ever going to destroy fears but we need to accept it emotionally it's not something we can just sort of think about it has to be an emotional process but, it, but it, we have to go through this emotional process where we release a fear and accept God's truth about that particular thing. That's what we need to do. So, so that's going to be important in terms of addressing our fear. So that that's the aspect of fear. Now let's look at the aspect of action. So I might just rub that out. So action. Now, we're in particular trouble when it comes to actions. Because remember at the first day we said that our uh, definition of love is completely different than God's definition of love. right? So, so basically, we believe, our belief systems are, that if we take actions that are in harmony with our definition of love, that we're going to be fine. Right? Don't we? We believe that. So, so we're basically saying that if I take action in harmony with sin, I'll be good. That'll be fine. That's got good results. That's what we're saying to ourselves. All right? Mm. But we look at the result in the world and we see the world's had lots of pain and suffering. On my daily life I have lots of pain and suffering, whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual, all sorts of suffering. All of this suffering coming, but I still keep taking actions in harmony with sin because I think that sin is love. I think that the world's definition of love is love. Big problem. Because I'm acting out of harmony with God's definition of love in a world that, in a universe that God created a whole heap of laws saying that this is my definition of love. And so, really, I'm acting out of harmony also with law. So, here I go, I'm, I'm, I'm taking actions out of harmony. With law. And I think that that is going to result in? Sin. No, I think it's going to result in good. I think it's going to be fine. It actually results in sin. But, but the reality is I think it's going to be a good outcome. So here I am, madly going around sinning, thinking the outcome is going to be good. Madly going around acting out of harmony with the laws of God, which are all consistent. And I think the outcome is going to be good. Is it no wonder the outcome's bad? It's like, because I don't even understand what's going on most of the time here, do I? I my, you can see my belief systems about what is love and what isn't have a large effect on the outcome of my actions here. I'm believing that things that are good, which from God's perspective are actually bad, I'm believing they're good and then I take actions on them which then have a lot of pain and suffering, and I'm going, and I'm all confused, and I'm going, why in the hell have I got all this pain and suffering? I did the right thing. Right? This is why we have a lot of confusion, because we actually believed that the, the unloving thing was loving, and then we acted upon the unloving thing thinking we're doing the right thing, and there's too many things now. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm just. <laughs> I know I'm losing you in the argument. <laughs> we believe that acting in harmony with love is the sin. In harmony with God's love is the sin. Because we don't believe, because remember the world's love and God's love are completely opposite almost on most subjects. So we believe that if we act in harmony with what we feel love to be, that's the good. That's the good thing. That's going to give us a good result. It will always give us a bad one, unfortunately, which we can see in our life and everything, and we have pain and suffering. But now what we do is we disconnect ourselves from our pain and suffering and we get all confused and we go, I've got pain and suffering. It must be someone's, like, it must be this really un unloving universe that God created that's causing this pain and suffering. Because, because it can't be me. I did the right thing. All right. Please go to Alex. I was just going to say we, we believe that there's going to be no joy if we don't um, do, the, do the good thing, do the right thing. Exactly. But what so I'm experiencing is like I'm actually experiencing some joy from not. Um, yeah, so we actually think that sin is actually joy and happiness. Yeah. Don't we? You can see a, a, a whole way of thinking is really messed up. Messed up. Messed up. And then, of course, we go, well, if joy and happiness results from sin, then who's not going to sin? You're an idiot if you don't sin. But then we even go further than that. We go, okay, no, let's look at it properly now. No, the word sin, let's get rid of that. Right? And we even tell ourselves there's no such thing as sin. After that, we tell ourselves that, you know, God doesn't have laws that you can break. That we, don't, we tell ourselves there's no such thing as in and out of harmony with love. There just is. And then we come up with all these fancy new age sort of concepts about there's the is and there's the isn't and then there's, you know, and, and now we get totally confused like, as to what's going on. And it's just like, oh. and And the reason why we do all of that is because we don't even want to admit that there is sin. That there is something in out of in harmony with love and something out of harmony with love. Yeah. If we come to Julie down the front here, thanks. <coughs> thanks for doing all the mics, guys. Yeah, been doing them. It's good. And then I think that if I decide it's not sin, then it's not sin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's up to my decision of what sin is. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> it hasn't worked so far. It hasn't worked. Has it? <laughs> yeah. So can you see how we get so confused about our actions? It's like there's a whole series of confusions here, isn't there? It's like we think that if we do things a certain way that the outcome should be good, but it turns out being bad, and then we're confused because, like, the bad outcome, but we did the right thing. So how did this happen? Our definition of love is that that was the right thing. So why didn't why did we get a bad result? We get real confused about why we get a bad result, and and so we then are very afraid of our next action, aren't we? Because who knows what's going to happen? One day it's good, and the outcome's good, and the next day the outcome's bad. Who knows why? I've got no idea why. So what do I choose to do after a while? Once you, you, you know, there's a whole experiment that was done, in, I think it was in the 50s, called Pavlov's dog experiment. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah where, where somebody, you know, some bright spark, <laughs> connected an electrical grid up and made the dog, uh, yeah, electrocuted the dog and seen whether he would jump. And what they found was that if you electrocute the dog and he can jump to somewhere that's safe, he will. But if you electrocute every pad... The dog will jump from one pad to another pad to another pad for a while and then he'll realise that every pad hurts. And so you know what he does? He just sits on one pad and gets electrocuted. That's what he does. And that's what you're doing. You're sitting in inaction thinking that every action is just going to end up with pain anyway. Does that make sense? Claudia. Uh, 
Um, yesterday, I sat and I wrote down something that I realized, and I don't know how to get out of it. So, um, I don't know how to interact with people anymore because I can't do small talk anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I also know too little about love and truth to talk about that either. Yeah. So I am afraid of making a mistake yeah. and that that might hurt others or myself. So I either slip into my facade and feel very aware of being in it yeah. and kind of safe but not right. Yeah. Or what I often do is I just avoid interaction altogether. Yeah. So like even when I talk about the way with Ina, yeah. um, <laughs> it often feels like uh, it's an addiction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And <laughs> so my question is... Well, I These are very good, by the way, awarenesses. That's um, very good. So Claudia. while I don't know myself and enough about truth and love, how can I interact lovingly? Yeah, well, you see, this is what's happened to many of you. So I just, this is the point I'm getting at, actually, at one point. So it's great that you've made it for me. The reality is that many of you, before you heard divine truth, were people of action. You took an action, had responses, took actions, had, and you were less afraid of taking action than you currently are. And many of you, after you've heard divine truth, have become more afraid of taking action. Because you're worried, oh, well, you know, what's, you know, there's the law, and what law am I breaking? What? And, and so what you've done is similar to the dog. You've decided to not take action. It's, become a, it's almost become a religion. <laughs> Hear about a whole heap of things, but don't do anything about it. Don't take any action. Because who knows, you might make a mistake, right? And a mistake's never good. There's always gonna, you might damage someone else, you might damage yourself, who knows what will happen. And so you, you feel everything's unpredictable, so you've decided that it's best not to do anything. This is what I'd like to address with you for the rest of the 20, 30 minutes that I've got with this conversation, is the reason why we do this. Why, why do we get into this state? What is the way out of it? Sorry, you want to... What is the way out of it? What's the way out of it? Yes, that's right. Well, obviously some beliefs have to change, Claudia, don't they? Can you see that a lot of this is driven by the fact that I am acting in harmony with thing, sin, thinking that it's the right thing to do, and then I get some negative results, and then I wonder like, whether I should have done anything. And then on top of that, because the world is in disharmony with any point of view of love, I do the right thing. And while God's laws support me, the world doesn't. And so, so God's laws are there supporting me and rewarding my behaviour in terms of there being no negative consequence. But the negative consequence comes from the world itself. Right, So the world itself is saying, you shouldn't have done that, you silly person, and I'll give you a bit of a slap around to make sure that you understand how bad that was. And so in the end, we're, we're bouncing many of the times between what do I do with God's laws and then what do I do with the world? What do I do with God's laws? What do I do with the world? The world's going to punish me for that, so I can't do that. But God's laws are going to punish me for that, so I can't do that. So it's better to not do anything. But unfortunately, there's a law of God that says if you don't do anything, that's also breaking a law. <laughs> I can't even do that. So this is our frustration, right? And we have a tendency in that place to not feel our anger about the situation. And we have a tendency in that place to not feel our emotions about it. And so what we choose to do is basically just potter on with our life, trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy while there's a growing awareness inside of me that, no, something's wrong here. Just like there's a growing awareness inside of you about that. <clears throat> so this is why we stop acting. Because right? we, we stop acting because, on one hand, we feel that if we do things God's way, the world will disapprove. And on the other hand, if we do things the world way, I'm going to get pain and suffering from God is, is our general feeling or you could say more correctly from the laws being present in my life and feeling the law, the result of the law. It feels like either way I'm going to get hurt. Either way there's going to be some pain. So what's the best thing to do? 
Nothing. But there's even going to be pain doing that. And I would like to just say, before I proceed with the rest of the discussion about this, we don't realise that, that the reality is the world is causing a lot of pain just by opposing the actions that are based on love and truth. It does cause us additional pain because we're living in this world. And that, that is the consequence of generations of choice. Other people making a choice to leave the world the same way they found it. So for millennia now, every new human that arrived on earth has eventually got to the point where they feel that they should leave the wor world the way they found it. They should just live in the world as they do and then whatever happens afterwards happens afterwards. right? And there's only been a few exceptions historically to that. Just a few. Right? And what I'm going to say to you is that you need to be one of these exceptions. One of the people who are willing to do things God's way, even though the world may oppose you doing it. You follow? You need to be one of these exceptions. And, and if you're not, then you know what will happen? We will leave the world the way we found it. And we will leave that for the next generation to resolve. And if they do the same, they'll leave it for the next generation to resolve and so forth. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't feel good to me. Leaving the world the way you found it does not feel good to me. And at some stage, you probably need to decide whether it feels good to you, if that's what you're going to do. If we go to Amber, then to Graham. Um, so if we do the way, mm -hmm. is it almost guaranteed that it's going to be lonely when it comes to human relationships? Yeah, well, not, not necessarily lonely. I'll be your friend. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, AJ. But I might, be, I might be the only one you have. <laughs> Well, you and Mary, I suppose. And if you don't like me very much, then that's going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I'll be very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be very lonely. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Felix. <laughs> that was my question. Yeah. I just have um, fear about that. Yeah, um, I feel a lot of people, Amber, have a feeling about that. And in fact, the first group raised exactly the same issue, interestingly. Yeah. So it's interesting how many people fear that, that in the end you end up just alone with no friends and no family and no one really caring about you. How's your security going to be? How's your safety going to be? I don't know. The, the reality is that anybody who's getting closer to God will also enjoy you getting closer to God and therefore enjoy your company. Right? But the trouble is on the planet is there's very few people doing it. And that's why it feels like the majority, you know, if, if you go back to your life, in your actual life, you know, your day-to-day -day life, you know, you, each of you are probably the, the only ones doing what you're doing. Or it might be only just a few of you doing what you're doing, right? And, and that's how it is for the first generation of change. There's usually one or a few people doing what they're doing, you see? So I can expect new friends, basically, by doing this? Yeah, and you'll also have to give up old friends. Yeah. And, and that, that's not because of anything other than that they want to oppose you becoming more loving. So, so at some point, if you love yourself, you'd say, well, if you want to oppose me becoming more loving, then I'll have to give you up and find somebody who doesn't want to oppose me becoming more loving, you see? Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. If we go across to Graham. If I act um, to make the world a better place, mm -hmm. but I'm doing it through willpower, then that's a sin, isn't it? Correct. So I can't even do that. See, my limitations are getting <laughs> right down now, isn't it? Like, yeah, you're right. Yeah. It needs to be a soul-based change. 
needs to be a soul by change. Acting through willpower in the world to be more loving obviously does help the world to a degree, but it's not going to be a permanent change because the permanent change is only happened through soul-based change. So the instant you leave the earth, it'll just revert back to its old behaviour. If you engage a soul-based change, after you've left the earth, people will remember you for centuries and remember what you taught for centuries. Millennia, even. That's the difference between soul-based change and willpower, use of willpower. Mm. So that's attractive, isn't it? It means that it means that if you do engage soul-based change now, even if you don't realise the change in the world in your own generation, there'll be centuries afterwards where people are affected by your choices that you're making right now. So that's that's a wonderful legacy to leave the world, isn't it? That's one of the rewards, right? That we talk about later. Yeah. If we come down to Felix and then across to Yvonne, on this side, if you leave here. Um, okay, my question is, uh, I've always um, had the sense that uh, I wanted to, um, you know, do something that was uh, really, like I suppose, important or actually made a difference or meant something or was... But I wasn't really sure if that's just my addiction or if it was actually that I was created that way to actually want to um, do something really just useful or important, just something that was, yeah. How I, I are you going to find out whether it's an addiction or not? Um, well, I know something's addiction uh, often just by the way it feels. Yeah. Um, and if there's some craving or if there's yeah. – it's often just the quality of how it feels. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. But I do know – I do s – s notice that I can have a, a you know be be imagining about something or daydreaming about something and well there's something that's an addiction in there but they also feel well maybe underneath that there's also something that's part of it that isn't um, so how addiction. do you know the difference making an experiment and uh, what kind of experiment would you do um, well think okay something that's that I feel is is based on love and it's based on my so you're taking design. an action yeah Right? How do you know that addiction was involved in the action? You, you think your action is right? Yeah. Right? How do you know whether your action had an addiction in it or not? Well, by... Um, what will happen? Oh, in terms of results? Yeah. Uh, well, there'll be pain to some... There'll either be pain... Or pleasure. Or pleasure. Or if we measure it more carefully over a longer period of time, there will be suffering... Yeah. Right. We or could joy. say. And this is something we need to learn later, which we'll talk yep. about more. Suffering or happiness, right? Yep. Or joy. Yeah. All right. So we've got a measuring system. Yeah. So. Yeah. Can you see it's just a matter of measuring the outcome for not only yourself. Yeah. Because it, it's terrible to just measure an outcome for yourself and ignore the outcome for Teresa. Yeah. Do you see? Like if, I, if you measure the outcome for yourself of addictions, then it might feel all good, right? But if you measure the outcome for Teresa and she's supplying your addiction, she feels exhausted, tired doing it and all these other things. Mm. Now we can see the true outcome, which is yeah. harmful, you see. I'm a bit confused about that. That might be a topic for the, um, the next session. Yes, yeah. we'll talk more about addiction because some people have codependency, which means both people feel like they're happy. Exactly. Or, or, or both feel, people feel bad. Yeah, but yeah, both. Actually, I don't know. If that yeah. was, was that good? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and we'll talk, yeah. About, we'll talk yeah. about that later. But, but basically there's a feedback system that God's already giving us with regard to our action, and that is there is long-term pain and suffering for the people who engage action out of harmony with love, and there's long-term pleasure and happiness for the people who do. But I, I was asking, does am I as a human being? Are we all created to actually um, want to change the world in a positive way? Because I feel that probably we. Do if if all of us engaged our real self, yeah, we would all benefit the world in a positive way. Every single one of us. Yeah. That's that's the way God created it to be. Okay. So it's not like God said, "I'm going to get you to do a certain thing." It's God's, God's really saying to you, I want you to be your real self. 
If you're your real self, the best person you can be, and you connect to me, God, yeah. if you connect to God in that process, God's saying to you, whatever is the best possible outcome for your life will happen. And, if, and part of that best possible outcome is you're going to affect thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people. You are. But not because you're addicted to doing it. Yeah. Not, not like because you're some pop star or rock star who wants to have the adoration of people. I have that, I have that addiction to attention. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not because of that, but because whenever you engage your real self, it's going to benefit not only you, yeah, everyone also, around you. I have a sense that it'll feel, it'll be a growing feeling of um, pleasure rather than with the addiction. It's like really nice and then it goes... Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exact. Well, you look at the average rock star. What does he do? He goes through a process, doesn't he, where initially he's in his addiction quite heavily and, and usually he's then on drugs and he's on alcohol and he's, you know, s screwing every woman that comes into his vicinity and so forth. And then he gets a lot of pain from all of those experiences generally. And then he realises that actually a lot of this is driven by these addictions to fame and glory and everything and it's all empty. And then once he realises it's empty, he engages his passion for music without needing all of that from, from everyone. And that's what I'm suggesting will happen here. If you engage your real self and real passions and desires, in the end you'll benefit the whole world, and not only the whole world, uh, there's, there's also all the spirit world that will be benefited from you doing so. Um, but you won't be addicted to the outcome. Mm. That's exactly what oh, we Thanks, happen. yep. Yep. I need to move on, though, because there's half of what I need to present <laughs> still that we haven't presented. So, we've been examining fear. We've learnt already now that fear is actually a creation of humans, needs to be destroyed by humans, and frequently we manufacture fear in order to avoid other emotions, uh, including other emotions that are real fears. We've also learned that a lot of the reason why we don't take action is because we've learned over much of our life that action in any direction results in pain and suffering. If we take an action in harmony with love, God agrees with it, but the world doesn't. And if we take an action out of harmony with love, the world agrees with it, but God's laws don't. And so we end up feeling pain either way. So we decide to not do it at all. And what I'm suggesting to you is that there needs to be a generation of people who understand that and then who make the choice to do the right thing no matter what. To take action no matter what. To be, do the loving thing no matter what. That group of people is going to have, to have quite a lot of courage as Paul mentioned in one of the previous talks, right? So we're going to have to develop the, the attitude of courage. And we're going to have to take a long-term view, aren't we? See, at the moment, what we're doing is taking a very short-term view. Our short-term view is just pain. That's our short-term view. We don't even examine suffering most of the time. We only examine immediate pain or not immediate pain. That's it. That's my only consideration. And pain is to be avoided. And so I take whatever short-term consideration there is to avoid my pain. That's what I do. We've got to take a longer view than that. We've got to see that actually, no, there's, two, there's a few different types of pain. There's the pain of the past experience that I have within me. Then there's the pain that comes from my present experience out of harmony with love. And then there's the pain that comes from the world, that it projects at me because I'm doing something in harmony with love. Now, to me, if I'm not addicted to avoiding pain of any kind... I will process all of those forms of pain and I will avoid the one form of pain that I have control over. Right? Well, there's actually two of those forms of pain, isn't there, that I have control over. I have control over the pain that's in me. I can release it. I also have control over the pain that I create for myself and for others. I can stop doing it. And the only pain I don't have control over is the pain that the world causes. So... What I've learned to do is accept pain as an emotion, <laughs> understanding that as long as I don't cause it for myself or for others, then the pain's acceptable. It's an emotion. I can feel it. I can release it. 
Now, I've been in a situation, as you know, where I've been tortured and other things, and I chose to go through those events because they weren't my choice. They weren't my choice in the sense that I chose to feel them, but that it wasn't my choice to be there. It was other people's choice to put me there. And those kind of pains I feel in a world that we're living in are unavoidable. And at some point I've got to use my will to choose to, to actually go through those experiences. Does that make sense? I've got to choose to make a shift in that regard. Right. So we need to stop being addicted to the avoidance of pain. Because... The one type of pain we need to be prepared for is the type of pain that other people cause through their actions out of harmony with love. But we've got to stop accepting actions that we take that cause pain. We've got to change that. And we've got to stop accepting the suppression of our own pain. We need to change that. So th those things we have control over. We can change those particular things. Now, the question then becomes, well, why don't we take action in that regard? Well, it's the same reason why we didn't take action when it comes to faith and why we didn't take action when it comes to truth. We don't take action when it comes to action <laughs> because we want to avoid emotion. We want to avoid what we believe is painful emotion. Can you see that if I was okay feeling painful emotion, then I would probably not be concerned about the outcomes except for an, the analysis as to whether the outcome was based is a loving desire or an unloving one, or a truthful desire or an untruthful one. All I would do is choose the truth and choose the love no matter what the outcome, wouldn't I? And that's the primary reason why we avoid action. Because we're not prepared to again feel emotion. We're not prepared to do it. We are addicted to the avoidance of pain. It becomes our primary motivation. Now tomorrow we will spend time talking about that. Right smack bang in the morning. Our addiction to avoidance of pain. Our addiction to not allow overwhelming emotion to be experienced that addiction is causing us to avoid faith to avoid truth to avoid action so it's obviously an addiction that's damaging our lives in many respects not only our life but the lives of many other persons here on the planet are being damaged by these addictions and we need to take a different action we need to choose with our will to love knowing that love has faith knowing that love needs truth knowing that love needs me to take action knowing that love needs me to feel emotion love is an emotion it needs me to feel emotion All right. and to have some faith and confidence that that in the long run god's good we know god's good we know that no matter what happens here on the world as long as I do those things, I will firstly leave a legacy for the world to learn about love and truth. Right? Secondly, once I pass into the spirit world, I will receive the legacy of my own creation, which will only be the results of actions taken in harmony with love and truth. Right? And we need to have that faith in that. And this is why in the first century I spoke a lot about the kingdom of heaven. Because I realise that the majority of people on earth have no hope for the earth. They have no desire or even concept that the earth can change. Right? But they do have hope in the future generally of some kind. And so what I raised with them, the fact that even if the reward doesn't occur now, the reward will occur when you enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? But what I'm also suggesting to you is this, that if enough people have the courage to engage the process that I'm outlining to you, then not only will we see our reward in the heaven, but also we will see 
the world change. And that would be a tremendous legacy to leave subsequent generations. Don't you think? Mm. If one person living in harmony of love and truth is remembered 2,000 years after his death, what do you think it's going to be like if a thousand people lived in harmony with love and truth? It's a pretty incredible thought, isn't it? Like what could be achieved by that thousand people? Uh, even a hundred people. Even ten. Right. So this is where I feel with regard to action, we've got to stop telling ourselves again. We, we, we're using these justifications. We're telling ourselves a whole heap of lies. We're saying we're like the dog. We're saying that if I jump over here, it's bad. If I jump over here, it's bad. So our best not moving. And what I'm suggesting to you, no, not moving is bad too. Not moving is bad. You've got to work out while, yes, jumping over here, being loving in the world can have some painful results for you personally because the world doesn't want you to be in that place at this stage. It could also have the potential result of the world recognising that you've done that and therefore the world changing to actually be loving like you are. That could also be a result. That is a potential but that potential does not exist if you jump over here and agree with the world. There is no potential for change in that place. There's no potential for a good result. There's no potential for a positive outcome in your own life or in the lives of others. And you're breaking all of God's laws, so there's going to be negative consequences in that place. Not just the consequences that the world gives you, but now we're talking about universal long-term consequences which will exist well after you leave here if you choose that course of action. Do you see? So at some point, we've got to start, stop feeding ourselves this crap that we feed ourselves about, you know, the best course of action is to not take action. We've got to start, stop seeing that and start seeing that as a sin which has far-reaching negative consequences, not only for myself, but for the generations of humankind to come after me. It has long, far-reaching effects, my desire to not take action or to go along with the world. Both have negative consequences. Honestly, my dear friends, many of you may choose to not take action. But you'll arrive in the spirit world, when, and when you do, you'll regret that decision. You will. For a lot of reasons. And my suggestion to you is to think about what that might be like if you arrived in the spirit world only to find that all of what was being said to you was true, and that all of the negative actions you took or the inaction you engaged has had consequences. And you had an opportunity to change that years and years prior. And ask yourself what you would do under those circumstances, how you'd feel. Because I think you'd feel pretty bad. And what I'm suggesting to you is you can avoid all of that. There's many of my friends in the first century that went through that experience where they did not listen, did not choose, only to choose afterwards and then feel the regret of such a decision. And my suggestion to you is don't engage that kind of regret. Allow yourself to work through that. Allow yourself to feel the motivation to change now, no matter what the world projects at you. And this is also why I said you have to be Live in the world, but not be of the world. And if you're not of the world, the world will attack you. It will. But that's not God's fault. That's the world's fault. Put, it, put the blame where it is. Right? Put it where it is. It's, it's because of generations of people before us choosing inactivity or choosing sin. That's why it happens. All the people before us, if they had chose, chosen differently, we'd be living in utopia now. 
We would. We'd have loving arrangements, there'd be no borders, there'd be no such thing as countries, there'd be no such thing as religions, there'd be no such thing as you know, anything that's divisive, governments. There would be governments, but they wouldn't be divisive. They'd, they'd govern our operation. Who needs to govern somebody who's already loving? <laughs> it's pretty, they don't really need that. And then there'd be all these collective things happening because we all cooperating together because we all believe the same truths that have been firmly established as truth, just like the scientific truths have been established. All these other truths have been established. And, and there'd be no disease. There'd no be pain and suffering from diseases and sicknesses. There'd be no illnesses. There'd be no diseases that are airborne or carried by viruses you wouldn't get sick like imagine now all of that's not happening now because the previous generations of people chose inactivity or chose sin and many of them chose sin thinking they were doing a good thing just like many of you do the same and they didn't want to determine what is good from God's perspective but they chose sin they chose sin or any activity. They didn't choose to live in harmony with God's laws of love and truth. And that's why you now, as a group of people, face the same problem. You now, it's on you now, you're alive now. It's on you now as to whether you will change. And if you don't change, then maybe the next generation will. Or maybe the generation after that. Or the generation after that. Or, or maybe no one will. Who knows? It depends, doesn't it, on the individual will of each individual, the choices we make. And what I'm recommending to you is stop using justifications for your fear and start seeing that actions need to be taken here no matter what the consequence the world puts on you. No matter what that is. You need to stop caring so much about the world stop justifying what the world does to you because you're trying to live in harmony with love and truth and instead just live in harmony with love and truth does that make sense yeah if we go to cecily help me on this side um Jesus, I keep stuffing up quite a lot because I've been hiding from the world for so long and avoiding interactions that I don't have control over and all that. Yep. So since I've been taking more actions, I'm getting a lot more feedback and so I feel like I'm really screwing up nearly all the time yeah and then i but that's i feel from what you've said before that i have to be i have to learn to love making mistakes because i am seeing i, I real like i i have to so take what's this the action. question cecily oh so i have so do i just have to keep having i suppose i don't need to ask well you know i feel you know the un said question <laughs> which which is basically oh you know i've done a whole heap of things in the past and they've turned out bad and now now you're suggesting i might do a whole heap of good things but that might also turn out bad and um what do i do with all this right what do i what how do i deal with all of this yeah like i i what i was going to say will i do i i just have to keep having faith that if i'm really praying and receiving some truth and seeing some small changes that I just continue like that and and that that I will grow more and change yeah we have to realize this that that honestly we have so many things like just firmly entrenched in us don't we like just firmly entrenched belief systems that are false you know, actions that we've taken in the past that were unloving and we now have to bear the consequences of and so forth, that we need to just go through the experience. We need to choose to go through the experience. Even the law of compensation is, is cho choosing to go through the experience where we realise we broke the law and now we've got to pay the consequences of that. 
right, in the past. We can, we can do other things, but, but what, what I would like to emphasize to you is this. The program we've got for you is to help you do this in the most, pra most rapid manner. Right. So this week we're talking about your will. The next weeks that we have, we'll be talking about yourself, uh, how to recognise what part of yourself is actually facade, what part of yourself is actually hurt, and what part of yourself is actually real. Right. And then the next thing after that, we're talking about more about God's laws so that you understand them better. And then the next thing after that is we're talking about how to understand sin. Like what is a sin, what isn't a sin, and those kind of things. So what we're trying to achieve in the program says, is to help allay a lot of the underlying belief systems and so forth that cause us to not have faith and to eventually get to a stage. So by halfway through the course, which will be this time next year, you'll be halfway through the course if you follow it, you'll have a good understanding of law a good understanding of sin, a good understanding of self, and a good understanding of will. Right? And then one more talk after that is about removing sin. And if once you have that talk, those series of talks, you'll also have a good understanding how to remove sin without having to go through a huge amount of pain and suffering. Now, by the time we've got to that stage, you can see that if we really apply it, our life could be like totally different by that stage just a year and a bit down the track. Completely different. Now, these are all truths I've already presented, of course, or a lot of them I haven't presented in this way, but, but we've presented the truths. But it's just been that we've ignored a lot of it, right? We've chosen to ignore it. We've chosen to use our will to keep on doing what we've been doing. So what I like about that, for many of you, is you've come here because you've realised you've done that. You've realised that's been happening for such a long time now and nothing's really been changing. And so in some ways, you're more motivated now than you've ever been before. Is that not true? Yes. Yeah, more motivated now to actually engage things properly rather than just fooling yourself or being delusional or trying to convince yourself that everything's good when it's not. Now you're being a lot more honest with yourself. That's what I feel from you anyway. Right? And that's great if that's the only thing you've learnt in the last 10 years that I've been teaching. Because that means that, that that's the start. That's where you need to be in, in, that, in that place. But if you follow the program that we've developed for you, in two years' time, your whole life could be completely different, to be frank. Could be completely different. Thank you. Yeah. Because I've just only just been understanding more about being controlled by spirits and... Yeah, you know, like that's just. Uh, well, this is the thing: is that even that is about giving up your will, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. many of you have been engaged by by with spirits all the time because you're giving up your will. You're not seeing the importance of engaging your own will, the importance of aspiration rather than inspiration, the importance of changing within rather than waiting for someone else to change you from without. Right? These are the things that you've learned over this period of time. So I can't say to you that you've learnt nothing because these are all big things to learn. Right? But hopefully if you engage the program with us, there's a lot more that you'll, it'll settle with you, it'll be simple for you to, simpler for you to understand because you've already learnt the negative effects of following sin. You've felt that result. You've also, many of you, have learnt the negative effects of doing nothing. Right? So that's good, isn't it? Like that you've learned that and so now there might be a stronger motivation to to actually live with your will to love yeah so thank you. I, I think that'd be great so 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 i feel for the majority of you you have learned things you just haven't learned the things you've expected to learn right yeah. isn't that interesting too we guess we guess ourselves all sorts of places but the reality is we have an experience and that teaches us many other things, right? And this is what I'd like to encourage you to do. Today we covered, we've covered three primary things. We'll have a Q&A about this subject tomorrow along with a Q&A about emotion. But today we've looked at three primary things, faith, truth and action. And you can see that in each case there is going to need to come from within us a soul-based desire 
to engage those particular things. And what I would like to you to consider is, if there's not a soul-based desire to engage those things, ask yourself why not? Ask yourself what are you going to do to change that? Because, because if you change that, then your life can change, but only if you change it to being a soul-based will to do these things. Now, many of you have punished yourself. Many have used willpower. Many of you have been, you know, attacking yourself for not being able to do it, using willpower and so forth. That, that's all done now. Right? You know that doesn't work, so that's great. You've learned something. All right? But now's your opportunity to engage your will differently. Now's your opportunity to get through these resistances to how you exercise your will. Love truth. Desire faith. Build your faith. Take actions that build it. Love truth. Desire truth. Take actions to receive it. Take action in your day-to-day -day life. Stop avoiding action. Stop being like the dog who just sits there doing nothing. Just do these things. So that, so that your will can build. When your will builds, now when we talk about other things with you, like your desire to feel yourself and your desire to be loving to other people and your desire to not sin anymore and those things, it'll make sense to you. But if you don't exercise your will, 10 years' time, still be in the same place. 20 years' time, same place. Arrive in the spirit world, same place. much better to learn how to use your will right now and in fact that is the reason one of the primary reasons why God gave you the gift of this life so that you could learn to exercise your will right. okay well that's our day done today thanks for your time today and tomorrow thank you Tomorrow begins at 11 a.m. in the morning, so not 10.30, 11 o'clock. And we'll just have four presentations tomorrow, along with some group feedback and some individual feedback, if possible. Now, up the back, I think, still is the books. If you want to ask for individual feedback, it's up there. And if you want to write down your individual feedback before you go. If you have disks, drives that you want to leave me to copy, please leave them on that desk at the back, and I'll grab them tonight. And I might not have them back tomorrow because I've already got four or five to do and they take a while. But uh, I'll have them back to you in the next few days. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Have a great night. Yep.